The reason we're having a judicial candidate forum today is because these are the forgotten races and with our ballot being so crowded this coming June 26th, some of you will get four or five ballots because we have federal, state, county, city, and state questions as in addition to um, judicial candidates. And judicial candidates are usually cramped at the bottom of the ballot in the most obscure place. So you're going to have to look for them when you get your ballot. They're not going to be at the top. Okay, I can guarantee you that. So, and the other reason we're having this is because judicial candidates probably have more effect on our lives than many of the other people we vote for. If you have a, if you're a victim of a crime or if you're have a civil matter before the court or a family matter before the court, you're going to deal with, you're going to be dealt with by some of these people. And it's very important that you know who they are and that you select them carefully. Okay? So here's my plan today. I'm going to bring people up, the judges up, who are competing against each other because we have contested races. I'm going to call on the, the uh, challengers first and then the incumbent if there is one. I'm going to ask them to each talk a little bit about themselves, five, maybe five to ten minutes. Tell me, tell us who you are, what you're about. I may ask a couple of questions of you and then I will let the audience ask a couple of questions. Is that fair? Everybody happy with that? Also, yes sir. Could we get an idea of what area each district is? I'm going to let them tell you that because they probably know you that better than I do. Okay. <laughs> And uh, I also want to tell you that on my cheat sheet that I passed out for you to put your notes on, some of the candidates have um, party designations. This came to me on a listing I got. This is a nonpartisan race. They are, the candidates themselves are not allowed to disclose their party affiliation. I don't know how I got this information. I just got it. I didn't think about it, and I put it on the cheat sheet. So most of them, I don't even know. So for what it's worth, that's the, that's the rule. This is a nonpartisan election, and the candidates themselves are not allowed to discuss their party affiliations. Uh, so let's start with uh, District 14, office number one. So that would be a Caroline Wall and Keith McCarter. Would you come up and have a seat, please? Doesn't matter. Just sit wherever you like. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Just a chair. I don't care. <laughs> okay. Since Miss Wall is the incumbent, I'm going to ask you to come up first, Mr. McCarter, and tell us about yourself. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, for having us today. Uh, thank you for the wonderful food. Uh, it's a great way to start a Saturday morning. Uh, with this kind of food. I just told somebody it ruins my workout, so I'm going to have to <laughs> make some adjustments so I have to work out harder now that I've had pancakes and butter and syrup and all that good stuff. Uh, but thank you very much, and I really appreciate your comments because judicial races do kind of get lost, um, and folks often don't have any idea how to vote for judges. Um, a lot of folks don't really know what judges do or lawyers do and that kind of thing. And a lot of people, I think, just don't vote because they're afraid to make a wrong choice, which I appreciate. Um, and so uh, I, I, think, I think you all deserve a tremendous thanks uh, for having us here so that you know, folks can have a better idea of those names on the ballot. When you see those names on the ballot, you'll have some idea of uh, maybe who you want to vote for or not vote for or whatever. But a more enlightened vote is always a better thing. So thank you. Um, my name is Keith McCarter. Uh, I've practiced law. I lived in Tulsa since 1988. Uh, graduated from law school at Tulsa University in 1991. Started practicing at that time. Uh, I was in a firm for two years. I went to the district attorney's office uh, for three years. I, after that, I was in another firm, and then I started practicing on my own in 1999. Um, I practiced in courts all over the state of Oklahoma, uh, state and federal court. Um, I've handled a lot of criminal cases, a lot of civil cases, 
a lot of juvenile cases, a lot of probate cases, guardianship cases, adoption cases, uh, you name it, I've done it. Um, I've also been involved in many, many other activities. Uh, I'm a minister. Uh, I'm a pastor of a United Methodist Church up on the north side, Centenary United Methodist Church. Um, I graduated from Oklahoma State University in 1980. Um, go Pokes. I uh, graduated from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in 1986 with a Master of Divinity degree, and then I went to law school. Um, and I practice law since then. I've been engaged in the pastoral ministry about five times uh, since I was 19 years old. And, um, and I've, since 2010, I've been a pastor at Centenary United Methodist Church. So after this, I'll go home and I'll work in my garden a little bit and then try to put a sermon together for tomorrow morning. Just a little bit, that's right. <laughs> Um, and so that's a little bit about me. I married my wife, Melanie, Melanie Hamilton, and we have three children, Victoria, who is 31, Jonathan, uh, who's in the United States Navy, and he is 20, he'll be 26 in August. I have to do the math. And then Abby is uh, 24. And uh, Abby works in a marketing firm in Jinx, and my daughter, Victoria, is uh, in mortgage banking, but her real love is poetry. So uh, anyway, that's a whole other issue. Uh, and uh, my son, as I said, in the United States Navy. We're very proud of him. Um, why am I running for district judge? Well, I, uh, as I told someone the other day, I, on May 19th, I turned 60 years of age, and I still feel very good. And I think it's time for me now to take my training and experience as an attorney and in other parts of life and try to use it in, in the judiciary. Uh, I do function now as a municipal judge in the uh, thriving metropolis of Ramona, Oklahoma. You know where Ramona is, yes. okay? So if you go on north on Highway 75 and you go toward Bartlesville, be very careful, okay? Because if you speed, you may end up in front of me someday, all right? <laughs> If you live in Ramona, you might end up in front of me on the following various charges. Dogs not on a leash, okay? Smoking marijuana, none of you will have to worry about that, and uh, other various kinds of things. We do deal with juvenile matters. We have two juveniles who uh, oftentimes ride their go-kart down Main Street. So we're trying to, we're trying to help them use their time better. So um, um, as opposed to Judge Wall, I don't have the judicial experience that she has, but I do have experience in handling those kinds of municipal charges. And what you learn is that <clears throat> there is no small case. It doesn't matter what kind of case you have. If it's yours and you have to become, you have to come before the judge and you have to come in a court of law, it's a big deal to you. And it's very important that you be dealt with in a fair way, an impartial way, someone who will respect you, someone who will hear your case fairly, regardless of who you are, and make a decision based on the law. And that's exactly what I would do as a judge. It's what I try to do in Ramona. That's what I would try to do as a district judge. Well, that's uh, that's me. And uh, so. I'm, so is Office One, is that a particular geographic area? It's all of Tulsa County and all of Pawnee County. So that's it's a pretty it's, big geographic area. It is. It <laughs> okay. is. It's the entire district. Well, you yeah. answered one of my questions. Does anybody else have a question from the audience that they would like to ask? Oh, I do have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it recently came up the uh, business at the Louis Cafe in um, Oklahoma, City. Oklahoma City. Thank you. Where a guy comes into the cafe, he shoots a couple of people, he runs out of the cafe. Two guys that were patrons of the cafe run out to their car, get their guns, and they shoot and kill them. Right, right. Not everybody in this room has a concealed carry permit, but I can guarantee you that a number of the people in this room have concealed carry permits. In lightness, when, when is it acceptable? Is that, would that be an acceptable use of the gun? Because I've heard there's some controversy because the men went out to their cars, got their guns, and confronted the guy. So if you can give us a guideline as to when you think it might be appropriate or not appropriate, to use a gun in that circumstance, because I think there's some confusion. If you want my legal opinion, I think that it's perfectly appropriate, because you can always use deadly force to protect other people. That's an affirmative defense in the law. 
uh, is self-defense. I mean, <clears throat> if, if I'm coming after you, then, and you believe it's deadly force, and you have reasonable belief that it is deadly force, then you can use deadly force against me to protect yourself. If I were going, if I were bringing deadly force against Judge Wall, which would never happen, then you would have the same affirmative right to take deadly force against me in order to protect her. So you don't, you not only have a right to protect yourself, you have a right to protect someone else. And my understanding is that's what those gentlemen were trying to do. So, and so I don't think that any action legally is going to be taken against them at all. Should well, there was some controversy discussion on one of the radio stations, so I just wanted to bring that up. Anybody else have any questions? Are you familiar with the Kenneth, Kenneth Ray Gum case? No, sir, I'm not. The fellow at Riverside Park who was, who, uh, was backed around his car twice, and he was 68, and the guy the guy who was after him was 49. He claimed to be in fear of his life. He, he shot the person. He told him, I can't run because of physical condition and I, and I can't fight. And the guy kept chasing him. The guy wanted to fight and pushed him. Later it was determined the fella had, the fella was on meth, the, the aggressor was on meth and he was, uh, he was legally drunk and he was the designated driver in his car. But he was legally drunk. Mm. And he was prosecuted, but he ended up settling, um, settling for a plea bargain. Yes, yeah, plea bargain. Mm. Down, mm. and I felt like he was justified, based on what I've told you. You, you think he's justified? Cause you don't know that I'm telling you the truth. Or not. <laughs> you know. I don't <clears throat> As a judge, I'm not sure how much I'm supposed to get into this specific cases, and and and, oh, I see. I see. and and so, I mean, I could say it seems to me he was justified, but I don't I don't have all the facts. I don't have all the facts, so okay. it'd be difficult for me to say for sure. Okay. Well, thank you, Judge uh, Mr. McCarty. Thank you very it. much. Thank I, you. I appreciate you calling. Me back. <laughs> okay. This is this is uh, Judge Caroline Wall. She is the incumbent judge and. Judge, would you come up and talk to us for a few minutes? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for hosting us this morning. It's my distinct privilege and honor to serve you, and I have served you for eight years. I am the incumbent for District 14, Office 1, and I'm very glad that 912 has produced a ballot. I see it's I, well, maybe you don't have a ballot. No, no, we just have a list. Okay, I actually brought the ballot as I have been, it's been mailed to me by the uh, State of Oklahoma Election Board. Now, you'll see something new this year. I've been doing this a long time, and so I do a lot of voter education. People do not understand how to vote for judges. Even attorneys do not understand how we're assigned our dockets, what responsibilities we have and how we manage our courtroom responsibilities. So when you see, when you go to the polls, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent, this year, if you're Independent, you just have the one paper. But if you're Republican or Democrat, you must make sure that your poll worker gives you the separate ballot. Very important, because normally, judges are on the bottom of your partisan ballot. And normally you'd go to the bottom and people say, go to the bottom or go on the back page. Not true this year. So make sure you get the separate ballot. Very, very important. And I've gone ahead and, and marked a sample. I've got plenty of them here. So you can see how it will be laid out. So we will be with state question 788 this year. Now, also in judicial races, when you have more than two People file, which in my office I'm the incumbent, the ballot will not say incumbent. So my two challengers, because I have two, we go to November. It's very, very critical that you vote wall for judge if you want to keep conservative, strict, judicial experience on the bench. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that in the eight years that I have served you in the entire Tulsa County voter district and also I serve the residents of Pawnee County, I have tried some of the most, presided over some of the most difficult cases in our jurisdiction. That would be first degree murder. I've done well over 20 of those. 
Uh, I've done about 100 jury trials, more or less. It changes. And sometimes when you do the jury trial, you could be, I could be in the middle of a week first degree murder trial, and then even when the jury is in deliberation, the person can enter a plea. They are allowed to do that. And I have presided over cases in which they have done that. So, in all of these cases, I've been consistently affirmed on appeal. In a very difficult gang murder trial, the appellate court commended me for doing an excellent job as a trial judge. There was an allegation of juror intimidation by the gangs. I have trained with the uh, Tulsa Police Department Gang Task Force. I, it was a very difficult case. Now, I've also done in my responsibilities, I did four years of felony, I was chief of the felony division. Then I elected and was selected to preside over a civil docket. As a civil judge, I served as chief of civil in 2017. As a civil judge, I do things like wrongful death, fraud, breach of contract, negligence. I just finished a five week or more wrongful death case in which every day I had to manage 37 people. That is a very serious responsibility. So not only was the case at issue regarding the death of three teenagers, their mother and the pilot, in a very tragic airplane crash. I also had eight attorneys, multiple experts from all around the United States flying in, 15 jurors every day. One juror had a, his first baby on the way. So we had to, uh, which he did not tell us. And so during the proceedings, we had to plan around his family's medical issues, which it turned out I had to make sure that the trial was completed or else we would lose that juror and have to go to an alternate. So we actually completed that trial prior to his wife going into labor on an emergency surgery. Those are the kind of things, ladies and gentlemen, that experience matters. Those trials, it's very critical to get them done thoroughly, responsibly, and to final judgment. And that is what I have done for eight years. And on the other spectrum of my duties, I deal with a lot of pro se's. Whether you've been in court as a witness, a juror, a party, representing yourself, it's, I do agree with Mr. McCarter, it's incredibly important that every person in that courtroom feel that they are being treated fairly, impartially, and that the law is being upheld strictly according to its plain meaning as enacted by the legislature. That is what I do, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm consistently affirmed in those judgments. When you do appear as a pro se, I make sure that I give some extra time. I do not give advice to the pro se, but I make sure that if equity and justice requires, I will continue that and permit them the time that they need to represent themselves. That is what our code of conduct provides, and I do uphold their rights. When uh, the questions were asked to Mr. McCarter about the uh, Second Amendment, that's how I would term it, I am a strong believer in the Second Amendment. I am CLEAT certified. I am a licensed carrying a judicial officer, and I'm well qualified to defend not only myself, but anyone with me when necessary. <clears throat> and as being trained by the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Office and as instructed by the Tulsa County Sheriff's Office, that is my duty, and I am I'm happy to carry that out. There are many times in the courthouse when we do have to deal with people who intend to do violence to those of us who work in the courthouse. So I do engage in ongoing safety training, uh, active shooter scenarios, and I am well prepared for those emergencies should they arise. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah, does anyone have questions in the audience? Because I didn't have any. For, go ahead. Yes. Um, there's a recent case in uh, Oklahoma City where the Oklahoma treasurer's son was arrested for child pornography. And that case disappeared with the notation bonds and gunnery. Um, I know from my own experience that you can just, on criminal matters, you can just file bonds for the penal sum of the case. 
and uh, uh, settled the case. Uh, given that, does that not violate not only Romans 13 mandate to uh, for government to punish the wicked, but also doesn't that violate the Republican form of government we're required to have for the public to protect the private? Well, thank you for the question. I'm not familiar with the case you're speaking of. In my four years as a felony district court judge, I have never seen or heard of, as you describe it, a settlement upon a bond. So I really cannot comment as to, uh, I'm not familiar that the law provides such. But as we know, things that you read in the media are not always represented as they should be and as they are accurate. What I can say is that when I served on the felony bench, and in fact, after taking office in 2015, one of the first cases I had was a sentencing on a woman who had pled guilty to, I, as I recall, five counts of child molestation, and I sentenced her to five life consecutive. Under the facts and circumstances in that case, that's exactly what I believe justice required, and that is the justice that I gave. Okay, well, any other you. questions? Anybody else? I don't want to rush anybody, but we don't want to be here too close. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, as you, you will see from your sheets, there's a third party running, Mr. Tom Sawyer. We tried to contact him. I don't think we were successful in contacting him, unfortunately. But I want you to know that every person listed on this sheet, we did make an attempt to contact him and give him a chance to come. So some of them didn't, may not have gotten contacted, or some of them may just have chosen not to come. I don't know. But we did sure make a try at it. Now, I see for District 14, Office 2, we have Mr. Shipley here. Come up, Blake, and tell us about yourself. And Thank you all so much for having me. Um, I'll try to be pretty quick up here. I, first, I'll talk a little bit about who I am, and then I'll move on to um, what my judicial philosophy is and what I would try to accomplish. Um, <clears throat> I'm a Tulsa native. Gosh, and I apologize in advance. My throat is really struggling this morning. We've got a... Uh, no, that's okay. I've been drinking coffee. We've got a, a nine-month-old who... Uh, decided she wanted to be fed at 3 a.m. last night, and so <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm struggling a little bit. Um, thank you so much. <clears throat> so I'm a Tulsa native. I went to Tulsa Public Schools. I, I did Eisenhower, Thoreau, and then Booker T is where I graduated from. From there, I went to Syracuse University up in New York. I uh, majored in economics and English, and um, came back, immediately went to law school at TU. <clears throat> and um, after law school, I was interested in criminal law. I worked first as an assistant public defender prosecuting, I'm sorry, assistant district attorney prosecuting, and then I later went to the public defender's office and defended, and now I'm out on my own and uh, focusing on criminal defense. But, um, you know, as I as I was working at the courthouse, first as a prosecutor and later as a defender, I was also taking MBA classes, and so I had the opportunity to learn how a business should be run uh, at night school and then watch how uh, the courthouse and other bureaucratic agencies were being run during the day. So that juxtaposition was, was pretty interesting, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, I've litigated over 30 trials. And uh, my hobby uh, outside of outside of work is is real estate. Um, my both my folks and my wife's folks um, were in were in real estate, and so uh, you know as soon as we got out of school and started making money, we started investing and getting interested in real estate. And so that's something that's really fun for us. Um, <clears throat> you know I. 
I'm running because I see a way to make Tulsa better, and, and I'd really like to be part of change that I think um, is happening across the country, is, is likely to happen um, here in Tulsa. And um, one of the things that, um, that I was raised with is that right is right and wrong is wrong, and if something is wrong, you work to change it. And so that's what I'm doing with this campaign. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I've been telling the, the table of nice people I've been sitting with that I'm, I'm very passionate about bond. And uh, I think if you, if you were to pull up our jail website and kind of go through person by person by person, you would see a lot of people who are there because they're violent and they need to be there. We, we need to take them away from society to protect the rest of us. But you would also see a lot of people who are poor. And, you know, whenever I think about government, I think about what I would do or what a group of people like this would do if we were all in an airplane and it crashed on an island and we had to figure out what to do with people. And I think if someone was a nonviolent offender, we would figure out a way for them to pay off their debt to the rest of us through productivity as opposed to just locking them up, giving them free rent, and, uh, and, and all, you know, causing them to lose their job and their home and causing the bank to foreclose on their house and lose that source of income from the bank's books and on and on and on and on. In, in Texas, um, I think about 10 years ago, they started criminal justice reform. And the impetus for that change was that conservatives were just flat out unwilling to pay for more jails. They just, were, they just would not do it. I, and I'm, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Prisons, they, they were not willing to, to keep building more and more prisons. They were not willing to increase taxes year after year after year. And for some reason in Oklahoma, we've been willing to do that. At this time right now, the Department of Corrections is talking about building two new prisons. And we're already ranked number one for female incarceration and number two for overall incarceration. And so, um, you know, we <laughs> judges can't get too political. And so um, I've, seen, I've seen it on other judges' faces who are up. Um, Sorry, and judge hopefuls, um, <clears throat> but uh, so so I don't want to be too political. But um, you know, it, to the extent that uh, that there's a there's a libertarian bent among this group, um, I think that we can I think that we can both save money and hold people's feet to the fire by rather than just incarcerating them making them work to change whatever demon is haunting them and get out there and actually be a contributing factor to society. So, so yes. So you, are you, so I, I take it you're looking for an alternative to bail for less wealthy people. So yes. give me an example, or do you, have you thought of any ways that you, what, what kind of alternative might work? You know, so there was a program um, that was experimented with a year ago, and um, and I don't know why it was discontinued. And and hopefully um, an incumbent can fill us in. Um, but the district attorney's office and public defender's office were getting together, and they were agreeing on certain people. And and I think a lot of them were women. Um, who basically are going to get probation anyway, right? And so we say, okay, you know, it's gonna be maybe a month or six weeks until we get the probation thing figured out or before their court date comes along. Let's, let's give them a PR bond, which is a personal recognizance bond. They're, ju they're basically just let out without bond. Um, and the judge says, hey, you know, I'm signing off on this. If you don't show up, 
you could be charged with an additional felony. Or they, they don't have to pay for it. Um, they have skin in the game through the, through the additional felony hanging over their head. Um, and so that, that was discontinued. I don't know why. Um, about, about 60 people, I think, uh, while they were trying it, got out um, you know, three weeks to a month early. And so, um, you know, in, inmates for us at the Tulsa County Jail cost about $54 a day. So you can kind of do the math about how much, thousands of dollars were saved for us. Um, and the people that were let out um, showed back up to court at the same rate as people who paid their own money. Um, and so that, that's one idea. The, the other thing that I would just like to reiterate, and this has been said, is it matters who your judge is. And so when, when people have bond hearings and when bond is initially set, it's just a judgment call. And so it might be that you just need um, different people in there making different judgment calls. Anybody from the audience have a Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, and, okay, in your years of practicing law, um, have you ever had a, a situation or a case where you had to go against popular opinion to do what was right? And if you can just... You know, um, I certainly did that every day as a public defender. Um, there are... There are a lot of people who... Um, are accused of and many who are guilty of uh, doing really heinous things and you know I I know we all read the paper and and we look um, at that and we're and we're afraid and of course we condemn it and that's the right thing to do but it is it is so terrifying how you really can't prejudge a case you know, you will, as a defender, you'll have people say, I know you hear this all the time, but I'm actually one of the innocent ones. And you look at their case and you're thinking, yeah, right, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, 60 days later, you get additional discovery or you interview an, an extra witness and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I prejudged that guy. And I was dead wrong. So, yeah. Does that, does that answer your question, I hope? <laughs> Thank Anybody you. Else? Um, could you tell us what area of the county is going to vote for you? Yeah, so <clears throat> my district includes the IDL and North Tulsa. It's, it's kind of a funny puzzle piece. I have a, a website. It's ShipleyForJudge.org. And there's an interactive map where you can zoom in and see right down to the street and intersection. Anybody else? You had a question. Yes. Uh, could you tell us uh, if, why you would make a better judge than the incumbent justice officer? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I I don't know what conversations go on behind closed doors and um, when the judges, the district judges, all have meetings. I, I haven't been back there, and she has. Um, I know that I would not, if elected, I wouldn't start yelling and stomping my feet and causing a scene. I would, I would quietly, diplomatically start trying to change um, the courthouse in, in the ways I've been talking about. And I know that that progress hasn't been made while, you know, during her three and a half year tenure. Um, I can also tell you that um, no attorney, um, for whatever reason, personality, you know, clashes or rubbing each other the wrong way, no attorney would be banned from practicing in my courtroom. And um, that's not something that goes on right now. So. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.
Now we're ready for District 14 Office 3. So we have Mr. Caputo and Ms. Pretty. <laughs> and Mr. Williamson did not come today, I don't believe. Come have a seat. Just have a seat anywhere. There's no pecking order. Um, I believe Mr. Williamson was just appointed Attorney Secretary, Secretary of State. State. Right. Yes. So I don't know whether he's going to continue to run or not. He is. He is. Okay. Uh, so that's where, then maybe that's why he's not here today, because maybe he's trying to figure out what to do in Oklahoma City. Okay, Ms. Pretty, would you come up first, please, and tell us something about yourself. Thank you all for having me today. <clears throat> I'm getting over <clears throat> some allergies. I had quite an attack a little while ago, and Fortunately, there are steroid shots for that, so uh, forgive me if <clears throat> my voice cracks a little. Today, I just want to tell you some things about me personally, uh, where I'm coming from, give you an idea of uh, my background and values. Not only was I raised, born and raised in Oklahoma, but both of my parents were born and raised here. Their parents and their grandparents were born and raised in Oklahoma. <clears throat> My maternal grandmother's grandmother, a Choctaw Indian, came to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears, making me a sixth generation Oklahoman. I have a large extended family living in Oklahoma, and I understand and appreciate Oklahoma values like hard work, independence, respect and character. I've lived in Tulsa since 1994. I'm married to John Pretty. We have a 14 year old daughter, Ryan. My husband, who was a former prosecutor, now is a partner in a law firm who represents school districts in a variety of legal matters. My daughter, Ryan, is an eighth grader at Jinx and she plays volleyball. We also have two Australian Shepherds, two cats, and a bearded dragon at my daughter's insistence. That was her dad's Father's Day present <laughs> about four years ago, and I'm happy to say that it's still alive. <laughs> I'm an active member of South Tulsa Baptist Church. I volunteer in the hospitality committee on a variety of activities that happen within the church. And I'm also um, a big part of missions uh, projects there in the church. As I believe that that is something very important that we're called to do as Christians. I also volunteer for the Jinx Public School uh, Foundation and the Jinx Volleyball Program. I grew up in Ada. I graduated from Ada High School and then I attended Texas Christian University. I obtained a psychology degree. After graduating from the University of Tulsa College of Law, I began my legal career as a prosecutor here in Tulsa County. I was hired by Bill of Fortune. I worked for Chuck Richardson when he was appointed and then I was uh, employed by Tim Harris when he was elected. I initially handled a juvenile deprived docket. I then moved to a felony docket where I prosecuted cases involving murder, kidnapping, home invasion, conspiracy to commit murder, physical and sexual abuse of children, and sexual assault. In 2002, I took a position with Allstate Insurance Company handling civil litigation. While I was there in my first year, I was recognized for inspired performance as a trial attorney and was later presented with the Distinguished Performance Award, meaning that among staff counsel in eight states, I had the most trial wins for that year. I was promoted to senior trial attorney also that year. In 2009, I moved over to a firm Steadley and Neal here in Tulsa. We're at 81st and Lewis in the Cityplex Towers, and I do litigation defense there as well. More complex cases than I handled for all state, but still the same type of work. As a trial attorney for over 20 years, I've tried approximately 65 jury trials, as well as a number of non-jury trials to verdict in Oklahoma courts and Arkansas courts. <clears throat> if elected, I promise to perform my judicial duties with the same integrity 
experience and commitment I've demonstrated in 20 years of practice. As a prosecutor, I was very successful winning all of my cases. Most of my cases involved children, something that I believe is very important for our society to protect children from abuse, neglect, abandonment, and other things that are very damaging to our family and our community as a whole. The other night at a judicial forum, I was asked what my greatest influence was, and my answer was faith. My faith keeps me humble, and it keeps me grounded. Judges make decisions every day that have a lasting impact, and I think it's very important that if you're going to vote for a person, that you know about their character and their abilities to perform those jobs and make those very important decisions that will have an impact not only on people's lives that are immediately before them, but in our district as a whole. Ms. Prim, yes, ma'am. Why, why do you want to be a judge? I've practiced for 20 years. I've been in courts all over this state. I've been in courts in Arkansas. I have um, experienced a lot of a lot of things in trying cases. I know what it's like to prepare cases, to evaluate cases, to weigh what our options are, what our defenses are going to be, whether or not we are going to be successful. I prepared jury instructions. I have argued cases to juries and to judges. That kind of experience is something that the bench needs. When you have been in the trenches and you know what it's like, it's a good thing to bring that experience, that knowledge, that personal experience to the bench. I can relate with what people in the courtroom are going through as a litigant and also as a survivor of a violent crime. I had my own case in Tulsa County when I was in law school. That's what led me to the district attorney's office. I was attacked violently and that man is still sitting in prison today, serving 400 years. I survived that case, and I understand what it's like from that perspective. I understand what it's like from the perspective of a prosecutor making these decisions, and I ex understand what it's like to be on the defense side in civil litigation. I think that's very important for a judge sitting on the bench to have had all of those experiences and that perspective. Any other questions from the audience? I apologize. Your name again, please. My name is Tracy Pretty. And this lady here has a question. She has a question. Um, you mentioned your faith is, is a huge part of your life. Have, have your faith ever played a role when you decide the case? And, and if so, can you give an example? Or? My faith plays a role in pretty much every aspect of my life. In deciding cases, I think that it is important to always thoughtfully meditate on, and, and think about what's going, what you're going to do. And faith, as you know, if you're a person who prays, you know that taking that time kind of, kind of sets the groundwork, kind of gives you, puts you in a position of making a thoughtful and measured decision no matter what you're doing. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Caputo. Come on, Mr. Caputo. This is Mr. Jim Caputo. He is the incumbent judge. Hi, I'm Judge Jim Caputo, and I am the incumbent judge. And after hearing all these morbid things that we do as judges, you might know me as the judge that does all the marriages in Tulsa County. Um, 67 of them on New Year's Eve, 67 of them on Valentine's Day, 43 on St. Patrick's Day, and more than that on Cinco de Mayo. I do them every Friday morning when I'm not in a jury trial. It's a fun part of the job, and it makes the job, makes me feel good about what I do as a judge. So now, I'll talk about experience. I agree with Ms. Pretty, it does take experience. When I graduated from Boston University, I immediately went to Washington, D.C., where I was a police officer in Washington, D.C. I was recruited to come here to Tulsa County to work for the Sheriff's Office here in Tulsa County, where I was a deputy sheriff for over 10 years. Um, after, after going through all of the ranks of Sheriff's Office in the first six years that I was with the Sheriff's Office, I was looking for the next challenge, and that next challenge was law school. 
I went to the University of Tulsa at night while I was working at the sheriff's office and had part-time jobs to be able to take care of my family. I graduated law school in three years as a part-time student, which is unheard of uh, in, in the law school world. Uh, immediately opened my own practice. I didn't go to work for any law firm. I started my own practice immediately. Within two years, I was appointed a municipal judge in the city of Collinsville presided over the same type of cases that Mr. McCarter was just referring to for 10 years. I was elected district judge in 2010, presided over a felony docket ever since then. Because of my judicial philosophy and my management of cases, I've been able to consolidate my five days of criminal, 100 percent criminal docket into three days a week so that I can do civil cases because one of our judges was just moved to the Court of Criminal Appeals and her civil docket is laying waste, which means every time you file a civil case, if it's assigned to that particular docket, nothing is happening. So in January, I volunteered to take approximately 40% of her docket in addition to 100% of my docket so that I could keep some of these cases moving on. Um, when we talk about experience, I have the perspective of law enforcement. I have the perspective as a criminal defense attorney. I have a perspective as a civil litigator. And I have a perspective as a municipal judge, and now, of course, I sit on the bench. So when we talk about equality under the law and fairness under the law, um, if you walk into my courtroom, the first thing you're going to see is a, a photograph, a painting of the signing of the Constitution, because I'm a strict constitutionalist. If you look around the courtroom, you'll see paintings and portraits of our forefathers, because I believe in that document. Everyone gets a fair shake in my, in my courtroom. The attorneys have get an opportunity to showcase their, uh, their skills in the courtroom. I read absolutely everything that comes before me. I'm knowledgeable about the law on that particular issue before I sit down at that bench. And my decisions are made timely, meaning 95 percent of the decisions I make are made from the bench at the time of the hearing. If there is an opportunity where I feel like I have to defer making a decision, I set a date for that. So the litigants, the parties, and the attorneys all know when they can expect to have a decision made on that. Um, I believe in, in equal justice under the law. Um, where uh, Mr. Shipley was talking about the bond situation. Uh, there's a preset bond schedule that has nothing, I as an individual judge have nothing to do with, but almost all the time attorneys are coming to me asking us to either reduce bond or do other things for bonds. We also have an organization right in the courthouse that's called the New Day who do extensive backgrounds on everybody who's arrested. And if they feel that that person qualifies for a release without having to set a bond, they come to the individual judges like myself to ask us to sign off on them. And I'm always open to signing off on any, anybody who uh, New Day, because they do that such an extensive background, uh, is, is uh, wanting to get folks out. As a former jailer, actually, I helped design the jail that we now have, the David L. Moss Criminal Justice Center, when I was at the sheriff's office. Uh, so I know exactly what happens in that jail and how that jail functions. The reason that the program Mr. Shipley was talking about failed was because there wasn't being an extensive background being done on these individuals. They weren't using the, the resource of the New Day program in the basement that I just referred to. They were doing it on their own. And we were having people that weren't being checked out thoroughly in their backgrounds. And that's what caused the problem, and that's what caused the failure of the program. But the New Day program is still there. They still do their function, and they still come to us judges. And I'm always open to signing off of that. How do I know this? Because I've got the experience. I'm, I'm the incumbent. I've been sitting here for eight years doing this job, seven and a half years doing this job. I can tell you that I've tried over 110 jury trials. I can tell you I've presided over five different uh, capital murder cases, which means those are cases where the prosecution is asking me to assess the death penalty and sign an order of execution on those defendants. I have one currently right now, and another one I understand is about to be filed and sent to me. I'm the only judge in the courthouse that does the two dockets that I just referred to. I'm the only judge in the courthouse that's right now certified to handle a racketeering case, of which I now have two cases and have had several in the past. So I don't sit idle in the courtroom. I don't see idle in my office. I'm always try, striving to try to be a better judge, to try to do something better. I know at the end of every one of my jury trials, I always ask the jurors, what can I do 
critique me as a judge. What can I do to make the next jury trial an easier uh, uh, or more proficient uh, use of your time? Because I like to be a good uh, moderator and a good uh, uh, person in charge of their time. Of those 110 jury trials, I can tell you that less than 3% of them have been reversed. I can tell you that of 110 jury trials, only 67 have ever been appealed. So if you do the math, that means three have been reversed. And I can tell you of those three that have been reversed, I asked the court to reverse one of them because after the conviction, more information came to me that wasn't available during the trial that in my opinion I felt would have a bearing on the outcome of that trial. The defendant was convicted of murder in the first degree. And uh, when this new evidence came to my, my attention, um, I asked the Court of Criminal Appeals through the, through the legal process to reverse that conviction and give this gentleman his trial rights back. And that's where we are right now. We're in that process right now. So I'm not a judge that's afraid to say a mistake has been made and we need to fix it. Someone's rights may have been infringed and we may have an innocent person sitting in prison and I want to be a part of fixing it as well. Um, I believe in, as I said, equal justice under the law. So I'm asking for your vote on June 26. Thank you. Any questions? Questions, questions? Yes, ma'am. Who is it that determines what judge gets what case? The uh, what case? Yeah. The individual cases are determined on a computer rotation, if you will. Um, when a case is filed by the district attorney or filed by you as, as a citizen or a party, uh, it goes into the computer system and the computer system rotates the case through the judges. So we have no control as judges as to what cases are assigned to us. Now, in Tulsa County, we're fortunate enough to be able to designate judges that just do uh, felony dockets, just do civil dockets, just do probate dockets, and so forth. So if you have those particular types of cases, then the number of judges, of course, in that rotation is a smaller number than all of us. Uh, but it's the computer that generates the assignment to the particular judge. If you could get a judge that isn't, you don't feel like it's being fair, can you request another judge? Yes. It's called the recusal method. I've been through that a couple of times before. Um, I don't believe in recusing off cases because I believe in my integrity as a judge to be able to handle all cases. I've recused off two cases. The first one was, well, the only one really that's significant to all of you, you probably remember Robert Bates. Uh, the Robert Bates case was assigned to me. None of the attorneys came to me and asked me to recuse on that case. It was the media that wanted me to recuse off of that case. Uh, after approximately a year and a half of the media trying to get me to recuse off the case, because I used to be a deputy sheriff, I found out that my partner, when I was a deputy 20 years ago, was in charge of that operation. And that it was at that point in time that that disclosure was made to me that I recused off that case. And then what happens is that case is assigned by the presiding judge to another judge. But in that case, I can tell you, no attorneys ever asked me to recuse. I mean, we have a question over here, this gentleman. Mr. Yes, sir. Um, how does one access a chancery court in Oklahoma? A chancery court? Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I don't even know what a chancery court is. You probably don't have it. <laughs> Prior to statehood, we had, it, uh, we had courts of uh, equity or chancery courts, and you had uh, courts of law. Okay. And uh, upon statehood, the chancery courts seem to have disappeared. Um, but chancery courts are supposed to be, according to uh, Pomeroy, I don't know, uh, 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 Gibson's on law or equity. Anyway, uh, they're supposed to, equity's supposed to be superior to law when uh, there are inequities existing between the law and the case. So uh, I was wondering how could that court have disappeared from our system? I, uh, most other states still have it, uh, but Oklahoma doesn't. Couldn't tell you. I came here in the in the in the early '90s, and I guess it already happened by then. So I really go. I really don't know. Miss McCarthy. <laughs> At statehood, the courts of chancery and common law were merged into one. So we still have chancery. It's just Probate courts of courts, equity. Courts, Divorce. And domestic courts. Mm -hmm. Those are courts yeah. of chancery. So yeah. We still have. Okay. okay. We do have courts of equity, but I was unfamiliar with the term. Okay. So. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, so it sounds like, you, I mean, you've done a lot of great work. I wonder um, 
if, if elected, what are you going to do? Are you going to do anything differently to make things better, or is there a type of plan going forward to? Well, I work a lot with the diversion programs. The diversion programs are when uh, low-level offenders are, are put in a situation where they are uh, afforded opportunities for rehabilitation, training, and things of that sort. And I've been a big proponent of that when the case, when the law merits them participating in those programs. Um, I'm a big cheerleader of, of all of those programs. I am kind of the first gatekeeper before they can go to the programs. I have to decide whether I want to send them to those programs. Then another judge decides whether to accept them into those programs or not. But uh, I, 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 I'm a big proponent of that. Like I said, I used to be in the sheriff's office, so I know what it's like to deal with overcrowding in jails. So I can certainly relate to the Department of Corrections issues with overcrowding with prisons. But at the same time, as a judge, my job is to keep people accountable for what they've done. If I can do that without sending somebody to prison, that's something that I consider. If I can't do it without sending someone to prison, that's something I also have to consider. So each case is an individual case that comes before me. My job is to try to determine what the appropriate decision is on each case based on the law, the facts, and the circumstances surrounding each of those cases. I don't know if that answers the question because we've got 37 judges, so me alone, uh, it, it's hard to effectuate changes system-wide, if you would, but I'm always looking for a better way to conduct my court, a better way to handle cases. I'm always looking for options and alternatives that can be utilized successfully uh, if employed in the court system, in my courtroom. Okay, sir. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. All righty, moving slowly along. <laughs> well, you know, you folks made the effort to come out, and these judge candidates made the effort to come out, and you you seem to still be interested, so we need to take whatever time we need to take to give everybody a adequate hearing. Okay, so we will move on to District 14, Office 9, and that would be Judge Morrissey and Mr. Chris Brecht. Mr. Brecht, I'm going to let you go first. Good morning. Um, I want to echo everybody's sentiments before me. Thank you all for being here. Time and attention on an early Saturday. Um, a little bit about myself. I am, like many of the candidates that have spoken before you, born and raised in Oklahoma. I grew up in Edmond, went through the public school system there. Um, I got my undergraduate in Oklahoma, at Oklahoma State University, so go folks again. Um, and I went to law school at uh, the University of Tulsa, so I actually had a very similar educational track as Mr. McCarter just a couple of years later. Um, and <clears throat> so, uh, after I graduated law school, I went to, and I was a public defender for many years. I went directly to a felony docket before um, Judge Kello, uh, defended anything from simple possession cases to murder cases. After uh, being a public defender for many years, I went into private practice. I worked at uh, the law firm Robinett & Murphy, and then, which later became Richards & Connor. And then after doing that work, I, um, I went to a law firm called Preen Redman, which is traditionally a workers' comp firm, and I do some of that work as well, but I've been very privileged and honored to uh, represent um, many individuals in adoption matters, both children and biological parents, as well as petitioners. So I do have experience in um, adoption and probate, as well as civil, as well as juvenile, and um, criminal matters, which are all four of the dockets that a district judge might get. Um, I believe, uh, my judicial philosophy, I believe that people should be treated as people when they're in the courtroom. As has been said before, when somebody steps into the courtroom, it's for something that's important, and it's certainly important to them, and I want to get back to the business of treating people like people. I think everybody is deserving of dignity and respect, regardless of why they are there, and it's my goal to treat people as such. Additionally, um, uh, I, I've, I've tried cases to, to jury trials. I, I know what it's like to be a lawyer doing that work, and I think that that's incredibly important when you, when you put on the hat of a judge because you, know, you, you have a practical approach to the law as well as a theoretical approach. And so I want to bring both of those um, experiences with me to my practice. I have some very um, extensive appellate experience as well, so I know how to analyze the law. I know what it says, and I know how to apply it equitably to everyone, um, regardless of their status as an individual 
criminal defendant or a major insurance company. It shouldn't matter. You should be treated exactly the same. So that's, um, I know we're kind of going long on time, so I will uh, just open it up for questions at that. Is there any particular area of the law that you're more interested in than others? Um, I was actually, I'm glad you asked that. I was actually asked that question last week at a similar forum. Um, I find criminal law to be very intriguing um, just because it is people and you are um, working with individuals on a very individual basis. However, given um, my extensive civil and appellate experience, I think I would be most effective in the civil arena. And um, our seat, is, by the way, is countywide, so everybody does get to vote for, for this office. Well, lucky you. <laughs> yeah, and it is a big county. <laughs> Yes, we have a question. Uh, what did you mean by theoretical approach? Uh, so um, when I say theoretical approach, I mean like the case law. Whenever you're, you, you read a case and it says what it says and how you apply that, that's what, I'm, that's what I was referring to by theoretical um, approach to the law. And then practical, you know, actually procedurally trying a case and, you know, all the rules of evidence, all the rules of civil procedure, things like that. Anyone else? Any other questions? Good morning. I'm Judge Linda Morrissey, and I too thank you for taking your precious Saturday morning hours to come and learn about these extremely important elections. As someone said, I think it was Peggy, you know, judges affect lives every day your lives, your children, your family, and so these are important decisions and I really commend you for educating yourself about the candidates that are running for district judge and associate district judge this year. As I look out over this audience, I can't help but think about my grandmother and my grandfather. Both of them were righteous, driven people who aspired to do good in their community, in their uh, realm of influence. My grandfather, for example, was a county commissioner, and this was back in the 50s for Wagner County. And he was one of the few Republicans that held an office in Oklahoma at that time. He was elected by the people that knew him, his neighbors and, and others in the community that knew what a wonderful, good, wholesome man he was. I'm so proud that my grandfather uh, led his community in that fashion. You know, I bet if my grandmother and grandfather were alive today, they'd be sitting right out there with you all. Because this is just the kind of organization that I think they would want to be a part of. So, uh, again, I am running district-wide, which is the entire 14th Judicial District, it's all of Tulsa County and all of Pawnee <laughs> County. It's a big area, but there's a lot of wonderful people in the 14th Judicial District, and running for district judge allows me to come and meet them, people like you that uh, affect my life and that I uh, am so grateful to get to meet and get to know. Now, Mr. Breck and I uh, are running against each other for um, Office 9, and because only two of us are running, we will not be on the June ballot. It, we will be in the November ballot. Those uh, offices where there are more than two people running for the office will be on the June primary ballot, but we won't be. We, you will see our names in November, on November the 6th. Now, judges run nonpartisan, as I think Peggy or Rhonda said. And, you know, we have very strict prohibitions imposed upon us by the Code of Judicial Conduct. One of those prohibitions is even uh, stating what our registration is. So, and we have limitations about expressing opinions about issues and, and being engaged politically. So. It is a little bit difficult for you all, for you uh, voters, to decide who you are going to vote for for these very important offices. And I would suggest to you the way to do it is to do exactly what you're doing right now. Come and listen to these candidates speak, listen and learn uh, who they are from their life experiences. I'm going to tell you first of all about my judicial experience and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about me personally. 
I currently preside over a civil document. In the 22 years I've been a judge, I've handled every single type of case that is dealt with at the courthouse, every single type of case. 22 years is a long time, and that experience enables me to handle these cases efficiently and effectively. When I took over the docket I now have that was assigned to me, there were almost a thousand pending cases. I implemented a case management system, and as a result, I now have fewer than 500 cases. What does that mean for the consumer, for folks like you? It means if you're assigned to my docket, I can move your case through more uh, efficiently instead of being mired down in litigation that's so disruptive to one's life. Uh, hopefully we can bring closure uh, and resolution to whatever the dispute is. Now, in thinking about addressing you today, I thought if I were sitting in the audience, what would I want to know about a candidate? And I identified some qualities. I would want, first of all, to vote for someone to be a district judge who had a strong work ethic. My very first job was when I was 13 years old, picking tomatoes in Leonard, Oklahoma, making a whopping 50 cents an hour. A neighbor would come by my grandmother's farmhouse, pick me up. We would be in the tomato field before dawn. We would stop at noon because it was too hot to pick after that. And then we'd start all over again the next day. I was so proud of that little amount of money that I was able to make to bring into the family, to help support the family. In high school, I went to Haskell High School. I worked at the Dairy Queen. Those of you who are from small towns know that most small towns have a main street and the teenagers drag Maine. Did any of you all drag Maine as teenagers? Come on, tell me the truth. <laughs> well, I got to watch the teenagers drag Maine because I was working at the Dairy Queen. They would loop through our parking lot and go back down Main Street. And you know, I would wave to them and they would wave to me. I wasn't embarrassed, I wasn't ashamed. I was proud because I had a job. I remember vividly one time scrubbing the floor at closing time and uh, some, a carload of my friends drove through the parking lot and I just waved and, you know, it wasn't anything that I um, felt I could not be proud of. I've always worked one or two jobs. Throughout high school and college and law school, I worked at the U.S. Attorney's Office and then on the weekends I worked as a waitress at Legends Restaurant in Norman. Um, I will say when I earned my law degree in, in 1980, I decided, you know, I think I've worked two and three jobs long enough, so I'm not going to do that anymore. So I cut back to one job, and frankly, that was a big relief for me. I would also want someone who has a strong spiritual and moral compass. I grew up attending church in Haskell. It was one of the highlights of our week to leave the farm and go into Haskell for church services. I attended Oklahoma Christian College and York Christian College. I developed a very strong reliance on my faith and God's will in my life. And to this day, I seek divine guidance. And that gets me through my days. I pray before my feet hit the ground in the morning, and prayer is a uh, part of my day all day long until I close my eyes at night. Um, I will share with you something that is very special to me. When I became a district judge in 1998, Reverend Oral Roberts gave me this Bible. And this is a treasure to me. I keep this Bible at my bench, right at my side. I want to read to you what he inscribed in this Bible for me. You see his picture here. And he said, this is November 20th, 1998, when I became a district judge. I'd previously been a special judge. To Judge Linda Morrissey, God bless you and the people of your court as you are guided and blessed by the word of God and by seeking his wisdom at all times. Sincerely, your friend, Oral Roberts. I'm sure you can appreciate why this is a treasure in my life. I would also want someone who had the intellectual capacity 
to understand and apply the law. Before I became a special judge in 1995, I worked at the Court of Civil Appeals for Judge Dan Boudreaux, who ultimately ended up on the Oklahoma Supreme Court. And I want to tell you what Judge, now Justice Boudreaux, said about my intellectual capacity. He said, judges must be self-motivated and possess a strong work ethic to effectively manage a demanding caseload. Judge Morrissey demonstrated both qualities while we worked together. She set self-imposed production goals, she was punctual, and she made efficient use of her time. She is intelligent with a sharp, well-developed legal mind. In her courtroom, she strives to create a comfortable environment to reduce the anxiety that citizens unfamiliar with the legal arena might otherwise feel. At the same time, she maintains a firm, orderly process and expeditiously disposes of matters on her docket. Now, let me tell you, I take great pride in those words from Justice Boudreaux because I absolutely strive to uh, conduct myself as he has described. Another quality I would want is someone who was a strong family person and had strong family values. I've been married to my wonderful husband for 37 years and we have three fabulous children. One of our sons just completed his military service in the Navy and will, be, will begin graduate school at Duke in August. One son travels the world as a journalist and our daughter just graduated from TU with a degree in chemical engineering and she will begin medical school this fall. I'm very proud of the fact that both of our sons earned the rank of Eagle Scout in, Boy, in the Boy Scout organization and our daughter earned the gold award which is equivalent to it excuse me, equivalent to an Eagle Scout rank in Girl Scouts. I was right there with them every step of the way as they earned those very important and frankly challenging uh, ranks in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Those of you who are Boy Scouts, if any of you are Eagles, are there any Eagles here in the room? I see someone uh, being pointed at over there in the corner. You know how tough it is to earn an Eagle, Eagle Scout uh, rank. And I have to say, having gone through it with both my sons and my daughter, the gold award earned from the Girl Scouts was twice as hard as the Eagle Award. <laughs> I would also want someone who's a strong defender of the United States Constitution and the Constitution of the State of Oklahoma. I feel so strongly about it that I carry these little pocket uh, copies of the Constitution with me. I've got a stack of them on the table over there for you all if anyone wants one. I would want someone who has been evaluated by your peers, by one's peers, someone who others have recognized as a good judge. I was honored to receive the National Judge of the Year Award from the National Child Support Association for establishing an innovative court docket to enforce child support obligations. In the first year, we generated over a million dollars in child support for children. The docket was designed so that those cases would be resolved swiftly in usually about 30 days. And because of that, it became known around the courthouse as the rocket docket because things were resolved so quickly. I'm really proud of that docket. I set it up in the late 90s. It's still going strong today. I was also recently named Judge of the Year by the Oklahoma Association for Justice, and I have been inducted into the Oklahoma Women's Hall of Fame. Let me close with this. Engaging with people like you all in our community, in their lawyers, if they are represented by legal counsel, to be of help to them is the best part of my job. For example, a distraught mother called from Oklahoma City a few weeks ago. Her adult son, who was incapacitated and subject to a guardianship, was in the hospital, suffering a life-threatening condition. The hospital personnel, understandably, would not administer medical care because she didn't have her letters of guardianship or the order appointing guardian. As soon as I 
received the call. Because of all of the experience I've had over 22 years, I knew exactly what to do. I printed off the letters of guardianship, I printed off the order appointing guardian, I got it certified and faxed it up there to the hospital, and that gentleman received the life-saving care that he needed. I bet every single person in this room can think of a story very similar, where you had an opportunity to intervene in someone's life and solve a problem for them. And I think all of us uh, take great pride in the opportunity to help other folks. That's why I went to law school in the first place, and I bet most of the folks here who have law degrees went to law school for that very same reason. You can find more about me, find out more about me on my website at judgemorrissey.com. You can call me anytime. I love to visit with folks, and I'll be glad to, to visit with you if you choose to call. Thank you very much again for inviting me. Anyone have questions? Questions, questions? Yes, sir. Clearfield? <laughs> no, I'm not familiar with the Clearfield doctrine. Would you educate me? Uh, basically, says that uh, when a, a sovereign entity enters into commerce, uh, their sovereignty is is uh, reduced. To, uh, their status is reduced to that of a mere corporate citizen. Interesting. Um, on Dun and Brad Streets, State of Oklahoma, Sheriff's Office, Police Office, Judge Morrissey, um, all are listed as private corporations. Um, what uh, authority would you say you have over a person if um, at under the status of a, of a corporation? I am an elected official, a district judge, and I'm not a corporation, so I'm not familiar with the doctrine to which you refer. It sounds like something I need to, to read about, but judges are not corporations. I am not part of a corporation. Uh, I don't have any uh, corporate authority. I simply have the authority that uh, is in, uh, imbued upon me by the state of Oklahoma having been sworn in as a district judge. Okay, so the state of Oklahoma is a registered corporation. Uh, so that's my point is why are they registering as corporations uh, when that reduces their, at least according to the Clearfield Doctrine, reduces their status. Again, I, I'm not familiar with that doctrine. I will look into it, and I appreciate the question, uh, but I think... And, and I didn't look up uh, your particular name. There's just all the judges I looked at. Interesting. Well, um, I just am an individual that wants to serve the people of the state of Oklahoma, and especially the 14th Judicial District as a district judge. So thank you very much, and I hope you will vote for me on November the 6th. Okay, now we have District 14, Office 12, that's Ms. Carter, and I spelled her name wrong, but she, oh, come on up, oh. her name is Martha Rupp Carter, not Cater, somebody can't type, <clears throat> I wonder who that could be, thank you very much for thank coming. You. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you all for coming and for sitting for so long. Um, you all have the patience of Joe. I'm, I'm Judge Carter, not Cater, although this, this meal was so wonderful, I wish I could cater. I would, I would if I could. Um, I'm a special judge, and my present docket is the protective order docket. If any of you, um, I'll tell you, if any of you know what my docket is, your secret is safe with me. I won't tell anyone else that you know about my docket. Uh, protective orders are very, very serious. When persons are threatened through domestic violence or violence from neighbors or strangers, the protective order is a measure that can be obtained by a person whose safety is endangered or who's harassed or stalked. It's very worthwhile. I've served it for about one year. I wanted to give you an overview. I think that I, I especially appreciate your group for bringing some clarity to a very confused area. There are 14 district judges within the 14th Judicial District. 
and um, I am running for one of two open uh, district judges spots and the particular area I'm running for covers all of Tulsa and all of Pawnee County so Darren Gantz wherever you are <laughs> it's bigger than Tulsa it includes Pawnee too um, as a special judge and I've served as a special judge for approaching rapidly approaching eight years now as a special judge I was appointed by our district judges and I've been very honored by their appointment I've gotten to serve in four different work areas or divisions within the courthouse I have served in family which speaks for itself dealing with divorce actions child custody important issues impacting family in addition I served a civil docket um, that also in addition to contract issues or personal injury issues uh, any issue that was ten thousand dollars or under I also had the mental health docket where there are involuntary mental health commitments of persons who are a danger to themselves or others also the uh, Department of Human Services brings guardianships for persons who are exploited or vulnerable and that was also a docket that I handled in civil kind of an unusual combination but it worked I was able to accomplish all those tasks following that I have been in preliminary hearings for three years uh, during that time I've conducted over 500 preliminary hearings in Oklahoma if a person is charged with a felony the state uh, must first establish probable cause before that person goes on to a felony criminal trial sometimes persons would waive that hearing uh, and the state is also entitled to that hearing uh, too uh, for the past year I've served in the protective orders so my experience as a special judge has been very diverse and very broad uh, if I'm successful in being elected as a district judge I feel ready and fully capable to handle any docket to which I might be assigned I too believe in a strong work ethic I'm there um, often late work on weekends when I need to uh, to accomplish the tasks that are that are before me some things take a little thought and you have to think about and reflect and understand the law um, as for me every party starts on the same starting line regardless of um, whether you're the plaintiff the defendant regardless of how you look what your religion your politics regardless of any other aspect everyone starts evenly I'm completely open and listen very carefully to the facts of every case um, I also apply the law that applies to that case uh, to to the situation I think that is a, um, a hugely important role of a judge to be an active listener to be open to the facts and open to the law I think as one of the other candidates said you you can't prejudge anything you may think you know an outcome and uh, the few times where I thought I might know an outcome I've been very surprised and found that once I listened to the facts applied the law to the facts that sometimes my prejudgment was absolutely wrong so I've learned over the course of time and I've been tempered to look at every case openly and fairly and deal with it as best I can um, I am a family person my husband my long-suffering husband who is going through this campaign with me is here this is Lewis um, and I thank him he's helped me so much during this campaign I have two adult daughters of whom I am very very proud my older daughter served in the Peace Corps for several years she was in Cameroon Africa and I'm still sane. Uh, I managed to say to stay sane while even while she was in Africa our younger daughters is studying early childhood development I could not be prouder of them they're a huge focus in my life um, I think in covering the qualities that are very important in a judge the first one I want to talk about is humility I think that anyone who sits on the bench who wears a black robe who gets to make the decisions that a judge makes must approach all these issues with great humility um, I don't think pride or arrogance in any way belongs uh, to anyone who is a judge I know that judges do and I do control your courtroom everyone is entitled to be safe and to civility in the courtroom and sometimes there are people that you must control but for the most part persons who come to court are respectful desirous of a peaceful resolution to their conflict and deserve to be treated with the utmost respect and civility um, so I, I strive very hard to do that you do have to be open you have to listen very hard if you don't listen hard sometimes you might miss a very important fact and you have to be very uh, willing to educate yourself on the law to listen to the uh, the laws described by the attorneys and sometimes to ask the attorneys to go back and find more law for you because sometimes there are areas that they might not cover 
I think that you all have been sitting for so long. I have probably a lot more things I could tell you, but let me let you ask me questions if you have any. Anybody have a question? Peggy, I think they're all exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me leave. Oh, yes. Uh, what is the docket for Office 12? What kind of cases? You know, that is a great question, and that's one of the, the puzzles of this. If I'm successful, then I could be assigned to any docket. I would be a newly elected district judge. I would, in essence, start over. My eight year, years of experience won't get me any special uh, standing for the docket to which I could be assigned. But based on the breadth of my, my experiences, I believe I could be comfortable in civil, in criminal, juvenile, uh, probate, wherever they might, might, might place me. Yes, it is, it is a bit of a spin of a wheel. Well, isn't there one judge that kind of lays out who has what docket as yes. their presiding judge? Yes, Kind Peggy. of explain that a little bit, because I don't think people Right. There is a presiding judge. Our present presiding judge is Bill Messman. And I understand that Judge Messman uh, does make those decisions. I know there is a vice presiding judge, and I think one other. I'm not a district judge, so I don't know all the ins and outs. But I believe Judge Messman would probably uh, collaborate with those in the, the leadership as selected by the district judges. And they would determine who goes where. And of course, our incumbent district judges would have first shot. If, for example, um, one of the judges is desirous of going from civil to criminal, criminal to civil, or moving around a bit, they would have first priority. And logically so, uh, they would have the entitlement to do that. So whatever would be left as a newly elected, elected judge, that that's, would be what I would have. That's an excellent question. Okay. And uh, may I leave you with uh, one thing, sure. or two things. <laughs> June 26, June 26, Carter will be on every ballot. Thank you so much. <laughs>
the winner of that race is here in the room, and I will not mention Linda Morrissey's name. But that's, that's <laughs> After that, my wife said, Brian, you need to go make some money. So I went into private practice in 98, had been practicing um, just whatever came through the door for the last 20 years. In 2004, I was, an opportunity presented itself and I ran for the State Senate. And I have served in the State Senate from 24 to 2016, representing Midtown and South Tulsa. Um, I share that because that is a great experience. If you ever have a chance to run for elected office, don't run against me, but go ahead and run for it because it's a good deal. I bring it up because, how do I say this? This is a group whose support I've always craved. Whenever I was in the Senate, I, I wanted the support of the 912. I think it's safe to say that most of the time there were no complaints which I took as praise and support but when there was disagreements there were strong disagreements and I'm going to single out two people in this room who uh, hopefully will agree with me later on but Amanda Teagarden and Rhonda Villamont Smith, Smith excuse me, um, we have disagreed on things and we have disagreed strongly not violently but strongly on a lot of issues I would hope that when you are talking with Rhonda or you're talking with Amanda about what do you think about Brian Crane, they will tell you he is an idiot, he is a jerk, he is just, he's a mouth breather, whatever. But I hope they would also say, Brian Crane's a man of integrity. Brian Crane is a man of his word. He will look you in the eye and say, I disagree with you. I'm going to vote against what you want me to vote for. I'm going to vote for what you want me to vote against. And here's why. I have never run anybody out of my office. I have sat with, I can remember one particular instance with Amanda when I was just hoping and praying that the sun would go down, but it wouldn't. <laughs> and I, but I want you to recognize that people who disagree with me, I think would tell you, Brian Crane is a man that you can trust. Brian Crane, you know where he stands. He follows through with it. He doesn't listen to uh, how the wind blows, but he, he knows what he's talking about when he knows what he's talking about. When I think about who I would like as a judge, I want somebody who is friendly, affable, understands the law, understands life, will follow the law, will listen to the facts, and will make a tough decision that he's not looking to, well, I know this person, I, this person uh, badmouthed me once back in fifth grade, uh, but we'll say, here are the facts, here is the law, and here's how it's supposed to be done. Any questions? Oh, oh no, this is, <laughs> this is a bad deal. No, I wanted to say that what you said was true. Even though we uh, did disagree on public policy, we agreed on the law. You were always a gentleman. I'll pay you later. <laughs> if anyone else wants to heap praise on me, please feel free. Well, I, I can say this. When we've had meetings, you have been a pretty regular attendee for a lot of the things that we've had when you were in the Senate. And, and, uh, and we're not an easy group. <laughs> I will agree with you that I was here whenever I possibly could and was invited. And I will agree with you that this is not an easy group. <laughs> Other than, oh, yes, ma'am. Do you know who you would go to to get someone to enforce a state and city law that's who, not being enforced? Who I would go to for a state or city law? Right. If it was a criminal action, I would go to either your civil. local. I'm sorry? Civil action. A civil action? My name is Brian Crane. I'm an attorney with the law. <laughs> <laughs> I think it kind of depends on. I would, I would go to a civil attorney. Now, if you were to go to any of the practicing attorneys that are here and you said, I've got a federal antitrust breach of uh, patent action, they're going to say, wow, this is great. You need to talk to, and they'll be smart to refer you away. Okay? 
if however it's um, I keep on putting a fence up next to my neighbor and they keep tearing it down and their Rottweilers come over and, and rip up my impatience, let's talk. <laughs> company I work for was recently involved in a small claims case and we were assigned to a court and I was there with uh, supporting documentation just with the owner and the judge uh, Meliodi. Yes, did a great job uh, as far as the room was packed and she organized it in a way that it got handled pretty efficiently and there were uh, mediators uh, what is your impression of the mediation process? Are you talking about for small claims court or Okay, small claims court, it's great. The problem that they've got is that there are more people in need of mediation than they have mediators to, to work down there. And so it's Judge Odie's responsibility when someone comes pro se and it's a, you're about to kick me out of my apartment or you know we've got a dispute over $2,000 to figure out which ones uh, require mediation and which ones she can take care of. It's like most things that are in the courthouse. It's a great idea. There's just not enough money to go around. Uh, it's a great program. And um, Meliodi is a great judge. Unfortunately, she's a great judge. Um, small claims docket has never been a prized docket among these special judges because every day you've got a packed courtroom and it's more, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. And there, have, there was a history, there was a time when uh, we ran through a lot of special judges because they didn't know how to handle that docket and there was a lot of frustration from both the plaintiffs and the defendants. Uh, Milioti brought a sense of urgency, uh, a recognition that everyone's time is valuable. She runs a very fast docket for all that work and because she's praised by everybody, I think she's there for the rest of her life. <laughs> she runs a tight ship. She runs a tight ship. Um, if you were an attorney and you're saying, I think we've got an agreement, but can you give us a couple of days? She's going to go, why don't you go out in the hallway and finish it? If not, we'll just hear it this afternoon. And there is no getting out of that docket. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, there's only been one case of meritry. Uh, uh, and I did not commit it, by the way. <laughs> That's true. Uh, judicial conduct complaints that have been filed uh, bar complaints don't seem to go anywhere. How can we hold judges and lawyers accountable for their actions or inactions? Uh, well, first off, let's talk about attorneys. Uh, probably not a week goes by that the Bar Journal doesn't uh, issue a ruling on a, an attorney who has been disbarred or suspended or reprimanded, okay? If you've got a complaint against a practicing attorney, then you call the Bar Association, you file your complaint, they investigate. If they see merit with it, they'll, they will move for a prosecution. There's a process you go through, but eventually that decision on how the punishment, if any, should be meted out is for the state Supreme Court. If you were talking about a judge, then what you do is you file a judicial complaint to the Council on Judicial Complaints. Um, they do their investigation. They um, reach their decision. But once again, you, you probably do not see nearly as many complaints against judges as you do attorneys. But as I understand that process, it still goes to the state Supreme Court. Well, you can't, you, you can sue your attorney. You can't sue your judge, but you can sue your attorney, depending upon what your problem is. Okay. Hey, anybody else? Going, going, going. One thing I would ask you to do, Brian Crane, Brian Crane, Brian Crane. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank You have all been so patient. Thank you so much. Keep your cheat sheets. Remember, you may need them in November, may, may not need them in June. And all these good folks have websites. Just Google their name and the word judge and it will come up. You don't have to know a whole lot. And there's a lot more information available on the websites. So thank you again for coming. I hope you enjoyed the day.